Welcome to Voices for Peace and Conservation. Join us in listening to inspiring stories from people who are working to save nature while also promoting peace. From the plains of northern Kenya to international conference rooms in Switzerland. Our guests will help us answer the question, how do we take care of nature and live in peace? My name is Hesta Grunewald and I have worked on peace and conflict issues for many years. I will be your host for this podcast on behalf of four organizations who work on conservation and peace. They are Conservation International, the International Union for Conservation of Nature, Peace Nexus Foundation and the Worldwide Fund for Nature, Germany. Our collective experience has convinced us that we need to work together much more closely as peacebuilding and conservation practitioners. Whether we are researchers, policymakers or activists, we all have a part to play. But how do we do this and what lessons can we learn from each other's work? Over the course of the coming episodes, we'll be exploring these questions with our guests. For more information, have a look at the podcast description notes. Voices for Peace and Conservation is produced by Impact with Joy. And now, enjoy the podcast. Welcome to the first episode of Voices for Peace and Conservation. We kick off our series with a remarkable conservation and peace activist who will help us delve into how does the environment matter to peace and how does peace matter to the environment? Northern Kenya hosts a unique natural environment that includes wildlife conservation reserves, farming and cattle areas, and Lake Turkana, the fourth biggest lake in Africa. It is also the target of new development initiatives after the discovery of oil in the region. How all these natural resources are used is therefore an important question, and the possibility of conflict is never far away. Our guest is Josephine Kiru, a women's peace ambassador working in northern Kenya with the Northern Rangelands Trust. Josephine grew up in the Turkana community and became aware at a young age of not only the violence between people in her region over cattle, grazing and other resources, but also of how some animals like rhinos had been killed into extinction. She decided to do something about it and started working in conservation, which brought her into direct confrontation with wildlife poachers operating in the area. So, Josephine, welcome to the podcast and thank you for being with us. Firstly, Josephine, where are you right now and, and can you tell us more about your work? Uh, thank you, Hester. Um... I'm Josephine Akiru working for Northern Rangeland Trust. Uh, currently, I'm in Kenya, northern part uh, of Kenya. Uh, my work in northern Kenya is to promote communities uh, in building peace. So you're very much focused on building peace. What motivated you to get involved in this work? In northern Kenya, there are a lot of historical um, issues in northern Kenya that uh, really drive the house or drive my life to be a peacemaker today or a conservationist today. I grew up in this society uh, of pastoralist communities. When I was growing up, I just grew up in a society which it's only experiencing the negative side of life, like people conflicting to each other, our communities were fighting each other, and uh, it was worrying a lot. And uh, during that, my childhood, that's the time also I was like thinking why this is happening in our communities. And also the, uh, the same thing, while the same conflict is happening, there have been poaching in our areas. There are many people who take advantage of the situation that we were in. And the only thing you could see in that society is the poverty circles that we are causing to ourselves, distractions that you are causing to ourselves. And when I was growing up, it came one day when I was in school, uh, when we were taught about the wildlife. And during my childhood, there were a lot of wildlife, except the rhino. So when I came back home, I asked my grandfather, uh, today we were taught about a wildlife. And I've seen these other wildlife around our areas. But where is the rhino? 
he just gave me a story that uh, there were plenty of rhinos in northern Kenya and uh, people killed them. I asked him, why did people kill them? They, he said, uh, there are many people coming, there are people coming from other parts of Kenya saying that they wanted their home. And uh, they bring wheat flour, macy flour, tobacco, and sugar for them. So because also the rhino was dangerous and the, nothing else we know about rhinos, we killed them. And uh, we tell them where where they are and they take their horns. So And we never knew the importance of these rhinos. That's the time now I started lo- uh, started loving that while or now the wildlife. Like I was questioning myself because today we are even eating the same meat of this wildlife, wildlife, like giraffes, because we depended on game meat. So does it mean that we cannot, see, our generation cannot see this wildlife in the future, like the same as I've seen the rhino? So I started questioning myself during that from that time. And uh, because I'm a, a, a girl, I'm a woman in that society, I was asking myself, so when will our people realize that even the killing of each other or fighting with other communities is not right? When will I be able to tell them? And uh, how will I get opportunity? Because I never saw women even participating in meetings. I never saw women even having any positions in our society. Uh, But uh, a dream, I had a dream. Like one day if I grow up, I'll I'll make sure that I school well. And then after that, I became a chief. The only position that which had authority that time is administration, is a chief. We call a chief in our place. So that was my dream for me to get a chance to tell my people what is right. But uh, it came a time also when I was married over, I could think that that's over. Maybe I couldn't, uh, I won't get opportunity. So from being concerned about the loss of wildlife in your area, you really started dreaming of how you could influence your whole community, despite women not usually playing such a role. How did the idea of establishing a conservancy help you make progress towards your dream? When the idea of the conservancy came in northern Kenya, it came in 1995, because most of the the, uh, wildlife uh, are found in communal land. 70% 70% of the wildlife are found in communal land. And the idea came in northern Kenya, but not all communities took the idea because the perception was the wildlife belongs to the government, but not for the community. Uh, in 2000 and, uh, 2008, I came to learn about conservancies uh, from our neighboring community. And that time was there is one of the conflict between my community and my our neighboring communities. So we la- I learned about the conservancies while following our communities, following up the stolen livestock. And uh, during the same time, uh, we got interested to know more about uh, conservancies. And uh, we started now uh, engaging our community to find a way of... Uh, starting a conservancy. And the mainly things that we are fighting for uh, between the communities we are living together were natural resources, uh, pasture and water during the drought. We have a scarce resources. And uh, most of the time in the land use and uh, leadership of the community because we are more than three communities in my area. And uh, when we started the conservancy, our idea was to bring us together so that we can be able to manage uh, our resources together and share it peacefully. Uh, that's why we started and established the conservancy. It took a time, uh, like two years, for people to agree uh, that they, to agree to come together uh, in conserving the wildlife or the starting the conservancies because the belief of the wildlife doesn't belong to us. Uh, number two, maybe the management of the cons- uh, of the conservancy. But uh, we are glad that uh, after all those years of creating awareness, uh, we came together and agreed, and we started our conservancy in 2011. Now, when you started the conservancy, there is now I really joined now the journey uh, of m- making my dream come true, which was uh, to tell my people 
what is right and what is not right. And also that the future of our communities or our generations are in our hands. What role did you play in the conservancy? We started the conservancies in northern Kenya. The key thing was, you know, in northern Kenya, northern Kenya has a history married with a ethnic conflict and insecurity, uh, which has hindered development, uh, perpetuated poverty, and uh, I can say disrupted lives for years. And the issue of coming up with the conservancies was actually to address such issues in our society. Like in my conservancy, as we started, as I mentioned earlier, the three communities that we are living together in my community, we were fighting over the land, uh, resources, uh, and leadership. And we, because we are from different ethnic communities. And when we started this conservancy, uh, I never fight for any position because I believed in, um, only leadership is for men in our community as we have met it. But, uh, because of the, how I engage myself at the first, at the first place to create awareness on the importance of this wildlife gave me an opportunity to be elected as body member of the conservancy. And when I was elected as the board member of the conservancy, uh, I was given a chance as a chairperson to lead the conservancy. That's the time men voted for me. I remember we fight the same position with three men, but uh, I got uh, a chance to be given that, to be elected as the chair of the conservancy. When I was elected as the chair of the conservancy, uh, many men uh, came against me in communities like, oh, why? A lady, a woman cannot make it. We are fighting with these, uh, these are our enemies. How can she be able even uh, to convince our enemies not to kill us? And uh, how can we come together with our enemies? Many people could not believe because we had a lot of blocks that this cannot work. And uh, But that never disrupted my spirit and also my hope. Rather than it gave me a challenge, like, okay, uh, it seems that they don't believe uh, women in our community. So my position will pave either the ways of women or will close forever uh, the ways for women to be given chance in this society. And uh, it came now to be three, uh, four things that uh, I've been dreaming for, which the first one was about that the cry was, which was inside my heart was the conflict between my community and the neighboring communities. The second was about the poverty circle in my community. The third one, the destruction of the, uh, this wildlife and the environment because we were we are depending on game meat. And the, the fourth now came after when I was elected like, People were against me being elected because I'm a woman. Now I said, this is the chance that I've been waiting uh, in my life. And at the same time, when I was elected, I'm, the challenges were there. The mistrust between the communities was, was, was very high. Poaching was very high. A day we can lose even 12 to 20 elephants in the same region. And uh, I said, oh my God, what am I going to do? But I really fought it, and uh, I can celebrate and myself even today and my society that we are celebrating 10 years to 11 years today of peace among our communities living in Nakuprat Go to Community Conservancy. While in the same position, I made sure that I brought these communities together. The trust became strong. And they interacted uh, in all positions. In the recruitment of any rangers, I do it transparently. I bring it to the community. I did it well. I never, I never did a mistake to do anything that will again break the, mis the, the trust between these communities. And that's how the, all the communities trusted me in that position. What a great opportunity for you and also such pressure to be a role model of what women can achieve. What were the biggest challenges that you faced when you took up this position? After that, 
the, the poaching was very hard. The other challenge in the conservancy. I said, what am I going to do? I'm a woman. I'm from this community. I've, this poaching is about a global problem because the market is internationally and uh, it needs international attention. Number two, we have a middle men who are business people. Uh, these are bad people. Uh, maybe if I interrupt with this business, they might kill me. I have no power on them. Uh, it needs government power to intervene. But uh, I said, okay, what is my strength? I just sat down and like, my strength is my community. Is to tell my people uh, what what is happening is not right. We are destroying our own future. And that's where now I started saying like, let me look for these direct poachers who are involved in this poaching because they are being used by the people who are benefiting from these uh, ivories, tusk and, uh, and rhino homes. But they are not benefiting, but they are destroying themselves, the future of their people. I started uh, creating awareness and also identifying them. But my first time to meet these guys uh, through the phone calls, and always I send people to them, maybe the relatives to them. And when one day just they wrote a letter to me and they brought as a warning to my door, and that keep away from elephants, elephants are not your children. And the bullet belongs to elephants. And if you disturb us, the bullets should be, will be yours. Gosh, so this letter was basically a death threat. How did you react? And what was your family saying to you? Um, the first time I received that letter, uh, my family was worried. Like, no, you should stop this thing. It's, you are not the government. Government should deal with these things. You know, this wildlife belongs to the government. So no, this, this is our future. I haven't seen the rhino. And what about the future generations? What about my children? They will not see even what is the current elephant we have, the other wildlife, the other wildlife that we have. So they got worried. But for me, I just moved on. I never got scared the first day. I got a lot of threats until I used uh, many approaches, but uh, most of the approaches failed. Uh, again, one day, because these guys were like, Josephine is disturbing us. They called me one day. I'm like, Josephine, you have been disturbing us, following us, sending people to us, and we have already had a lot of things that you have said good things we want to meet and we want we want you because i was so excited and i know that at uh, home oh, i saw like this is an opportunity for me now to get these guy guys and talk to them and uh, hey, this is a good opportunity so with that excitement and something that i've been looking for many years opportunity i just uh rushed where they were they called where they told me to come but i never knew what was a trap and uh, I just suddenly, I just suddenly saw people coming from the bush, and one guy pointing a gun to me. Others are rising me, kneel down, doing a lot of things. So I said, I just felt my uh, in my heart like, okay, this is the end. I said to myself, okay, if it's the end, so what? I just kneel down. I agreed with whatever they said. I just kneel down. They did their what I told them. But what I told them is, okay, I'm not, I want you to listen to me for a few minutes. I'm not doing what I'm doing today because that I'm paid. I'm not doing what I'm doing it today, not because of my personal uh, interest. It's because of our future, our future, our, our future and our community. I just started speaking out. Like, one, you you know this wildlife are no longer for government. These are our wildlife. These are our resources. We are all killing our resources, which could change our lives. I mentioned about the rhinos. You remember our grandparents killed our rhinos, but they we are still poor. Nobody was taken to school. That's, that it has changed nothing in our community. But today again we are joining the same system, we are going to finish this wildlife and it won't change anything. Today, this wildlife has brought job opportunities in our communities. 
we have conservancies. If your brothers are employed, your cousins are employed, even if you have not been employed, but there are people working which are from our community. And that shows that this wildlife belongs to us. It's no longer for government, it is ours. Today, you might go for poaching and the someone who will kill you is your brother, a ranger, or you kill that ranger. You've been celebrating maybe killing each other with the other rangers, KWS, Kenya Wildlife Service. But today, the role has been brought to your own people. You'll be killing each other. And I also reminded one thing, that can you remember, uh, mention the names, uh, he was killed. Look at his family today, the way they're struggling, the children, the way they're living. The same, same way will happen to you. But when we lose you all today because of this act, that is not beneficial to you and to your community, how will the community be? Who will fight for us even? I just say that, who will fight for us? All, if all of you are uh, great men, warriors of our society, that is because of this poaching. So who will be there for us? And uh, the guy who was pointing a gun to me who is now our ranger, just said, he dropped the gun and said, no, let's stop. Let, do, don't, let us not kill her. Nobody has ever told us the truth. She, she has told us the truth. So he commanded, he was like, the commander in that team, like, Woke up and go and never tell anybody this story. And I have ne I never told anyone this story until like two years after they reformed and um, uh, they reformed and they went to I went to the government to plead with the government that these guys are reformed. We want to, to forgive them and also make them have their own freedom. And I will monitor them through the conservancy. They will they because they com they they committed that. Uh, uh, they will volunteer in the conservancies uh, in the conservancy to uh, to make sure that there is no poaching. There will be peace uh, among our communities. They will assist me as my peace ambassadors. They will assist me as a, a rangers, volunteer as a rangers. So we pleaded with the government after the government uh, agreed and uh, forgiven them. Uh, they now came out. And uh, I never knew that even, I never told this, this story out until now when most of them became rangers, peace ambassadors in our society. That's when I told the story. Wow, what an amazing outcome. What do you think were some of the other successes that you've achieved through this work? So the journey of the, or the my journey in conservation was very tough, but with a successful story that will will encourage many women, young people, emerging leaders, uh, to take charge, to start building for our future generations. We'll start thinking about uh, that people have a role to play for a better future in our society. So it was a good one. And uh, by supporting conservation, by supporting this uh, women in leadership, women to have role in the conservancy, in, in communities or in conservation, actually is paving a way, giving a hope for our societies, for our communities in Kenya. Today, in Northern Kenya, uh, the conservancies have become a forum or a tool or a structure that unites our people, bridging the gaps that already hatred brought in between us for many years. The conservancies are bridging it up because communication, it helps us to communicate to each other. It helps the communities to communicate to each other. It's a communication tool. It's uniting us. And this is all about environment. When we talk about environment and peace, environment matters a lot. Uh, in peace building in our society. Because what we are experiencing in Northern Kenya, among them is resource-based conflict. And when we compete uh, over these uh, uh, scarce resources, uh, it leads to clashes and loss of lives. So by conserving or by uh, by by protecting the environment, it reduces resource-based conflict because we are going to share 
our water or our pasture together. And today, as a peace builder, as a peace ambassador in my community, my work is to bring these communities together to be able to agree in solving their conflict when it arises. And as an RT, we are strengthening the conservancy structures uh, by building their capacity. Uh, even today when Josephine is not there, I believe that they can be able to solve their, co their conflict or when it arises. There are moments in my life that I, I could not see anyone closer to me because when the conf conflict occurs, maybe between my community where I'm coming from and other neighboring communities, and because I'm a peace builder, I'm just a neutral person, a neutral party in that conflict. My communities felt, sometimes feel against, feel that I betray them by like saying, no, uh, there is no retaliations. We can solve this. I remember 2015, my mother left me. Everyone left me. I had no friend to be close with. Everyone was afraid to be attached to me because they were afraid they might be, if we associate with Josephine, you might be killed when she's killed, she, she, when she is killed. So I just remained alone in that year that nobody communicated to me. So most of the time uh, in this work, you can get a challenging moment in life that you never have a friend in life even to lean on or anyone to communicate to, like the moments that I passed through. But what gave me my strength during all this moment when everybody left me, felt me like I'm an enemy in this, this society is the inner spirit inside me that was sure that what I'm doing is right. And I'm happy after all that year, 2016 now is when uh, I came because I'm a peace builder. I reconciled back with my community, my family first, 2016, uh, April. And I, t I told them, okay, it's fine. There's no problem. I know we are a human being. We can fear. Uh, but uh, the right thing is we need to stuck in the right path and tell our people what is right. And through all those challenges that I passed through, it also not uh, discouraged me. It, I remember it builded me, uh, gave me strength. And uh, I have a story to tell today. And I'm happy today, many women in my community, when anything happens in our society, even if they fight for any position, they will quote Josephine. They will say that Josephine, she did it. If we give a woman leadership, she will do it. So I'm happy because many women today, they are chiefs in my community. And one of the uh, minister today we have in my community, also, she uses me as a role model. She got that chance also because people said, okay, Josephine did it and they can do it. And that's what I'm proud of. I'm more happy today and uh, through Conservation International, uh, from last year, I was able to recruit 25 women peace ambassadors that they will be in my position so that we can take our community to another level. And if I see today what is happening, I see a big hope uh, ahead of us. I see a good future in our, in our society. That's that's fantastic. And really the, the role that you've played as a role model and just inspiring other women in your community, I'm, I, it sounds like it's been such a great success. And thank you for your courage. Thank you for sharing this this picture with us and for telling us all about, about your work. And we really wish you all the best. Thank you, Estelle. This episode's content was provided by the Peace Nexus Foundation. Headquartered in Switzerland, it has staff in West Africa, Central Asia, Southeast Asia, and the Western Balkans. Peace Nexus supports international and local civil society, government institutions, and companies who want to better understand their contexts and become more effective in peacebuilding. Like all other partners of this podcast, Peace Nexus wants to see peacebuilding and conservation work be much more connected so that practitioners can learn from each other and achieve greater impact together. To find out more about the work of Peace Nexus, visit their website, peacenexus.org, 
or follow them on LinkedIn. Join me in the next episode where we will explore how climate-related impacts are affecting conservation efforts and tense social dynamics in a sensitive context and what practitioners are doing about it. Be sure to sign up or follow us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or your favorite podcast platform. Thank you very much for listening. Have a great day and see you next time.